The next panel is called um, The Clouding of Entertainment Media, The Challenges Giving Consumers What They Want, Where They Want It. Um, and uh, let's just um, believe that the infrastructure exists to actually enable that. Let's suspend disbelief for a second. We'll have a good discussion. I think what we want to do with this panel, um, this summer we had a working group meeting at the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee looking at the kind of explosion of cloud music locker services. Um, and we looked at that. We also looked at, you know, forecasting what type of cloud uh, entertainment services would be in general. Um, and there was a lot of discussion about, from the marketplace perspective, of how licensing and, and piracy and, and other things um, uh, really affect that market. So we wanted to have a discussion with, with people to kind of talk about kind of at a higher level uh, some of the business aspects related to assuming that the, the, infrastructure, the broadband infrastructure exists uh, to enable these things and people have their, their entertainment in different lockers whether it's iCloud, the Apple iTunes iCloud locker service or the Amazon uh, iCloud service or some other type of service, um, uh, you know, can't, are the licensing um, things there um, to, to enable that, that as well? Uh, Congressman Goodlatte had an interesting luncheon keynote with, um, with Tim Whiskerin, who's the founder of, of Pandora Media yesterday, and one of the things he said that was interesting from, an inter from a licensing perspective, he said because of sound exchange uh, through the Library of Congress when it comes to streaming of, of, of music content, um, he said that Pandora, Pandora only really exists in the United States and can't, they can't really do it in other countries because there's nothing equivalent to uh, sound exchange in other countries. So that was an interesting twist on um, how licensing affects some of these really interesting services that are rolling out, whether it be lockers and things like that. So uh, we wanted to walk, talk about, to some experts about whether or not there'd be uh, the legal framework, the policy framework to enable these things. Um, one of the panelists we really wanted to have here was um, Ultraviolet, which is um, kind of a, a service uh, that allows for users to access a digital copy of, of, of a major work. Um, and they're rolling that, that out, the entertainment companies are rolling that out. Um, we weren't able to find someone from Ultraviolet to speak and we kind of tailored this thing towards having them on the panel, so I apologize for that. Um, so let me just um, start with our panelists and, and I'm, I'm, we're stealing some time, uh, trying to make up some time and I'm stealing some time from Larry Irving who's the moderator of our last panel um, and he's gonna be very upset with me when he arrives, so I apologize. But um, we have Michael Smith, who um, is a professor of information systems and marketing at Carnegie Mellon. He also holds appointments at the Tep, uh, Tepper School of Business. Um, he's a PhD from MIT from Sloan, um, so he is actually Dr. Uh, Smith. Um, and um, he, Professor Smith uses uh, economic and statistical techniques to analyze um, firm and consumer behavior in online markets. Um, then we'll go to Larry, Larry Downs, who's a consultant and author, uh, writes about, from Silicon Valley, writes about disruptive, disruptive technologies. His latest book is called um, The Laws of Disruption. Uh, next to him, we'll go to uh, Daniel Raymer um, from RapidShare, which is an online uh, locker service in Germany. Um, and uh, you also, you're a general counsel, you have your law degree um, from, and a master's in law from University of San Diego. And, and then finally, Lee Knife, who's who is the um, acting director or the executive director of the Digital Media Association, represents, represents um, entertainment services companies like Apple iTunes, uh, YouTube, uh, and others. So um, with that, let me just uh, start off with Michael Smith. And if we could just maybe truncate our comments just a bit because um, we're going to try to make up some time here. Um, I apologize, Mike. Um, Doctor. <laughs> so it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I just want to thank the, the organizers of, of the conference, um, and I really look forward to the interaction on this. I will uh, uh, frame my comments a little bit by talking about the college I come from. The, the Heinz College at Carnegie Mellon University is a combination of a college of information systems and management and a college, college of Public Policy and Management. So, so myself and most of my colleagues get really excited about questions like the ones we're going to talk about today that combine technology, real-life management questions, and real-life policy questions. Uh, as the token academic on the panel, I, I assume you'd be disappointed if I didn't present a couple of uh, geeky academic frameworks. So, so let me just try to, try to briefly present three uh, high-level frameworks that I found helpful in my research and, and teaching and, and that might be uh, useful to frame our discussion today. The, the first one is thinking about what businesses do. What does a business do? One way of conceptualizing that is businesses create value and they extract value. So industries make a pie, and hopefully a big pie, and then debate about how, what, how to slice that pie. Okay? 
How does that apply to the media industry as well? It applies quite naturally. That we've seen massive changes in the size of the media pie because of technology. The amount of value you can create by delivering music and other content directly to my phone when I want it, where I want it, how I want it, uh, is huge. Um, and by the same token, we've seen changes in how we slice up that pie. Uh, and I wonder if that might be an interesting metaphor for how we think about policy in terms of creating a playing field where the, both the media companies and the technology companies can create as big a pie as possible uh, and then hoping that dividing that pie takes care of itself. And we'll see. Uh, second framework that I think might be interesting is, is thinking about industry structure. Who's in the industry and who does, who does what pieces, what, what jobs in the industry? And again, this is something where in the media industries we've seen massive change uh, about the structure of the industry. We talk about that in a variety of ways. One item that I think is under-discussed relative to its value is the importance of data. If you think historically about media industries, they've had very poor data about individual customer preferences, individual customer price sensitivity, individual customer uh, merchandising preferences, what goes with what. Goes with what. And because of that, because the data wasn't there, not surprisingly, they haven't invested a whole lot in the analytic capabilities necessary to analyze that data. Contrast that with Apple, Amazon, Google. Those are data companies. And not only are they good at analyzing the data, they own the data in many cases. And I wonder whether the companies that are going to succeed in the future are going to be the ones who are good at owning and collecting the data and intelligently analyzing it. Last framework uh, is uh, decision making. A lot of the discussion I see in the press revolves around media companies conceptualizing a consumer's decision process as the consumer chooses the product and then they choose the channel to consume that product in. And if you live in that sort of world, the different channels start to look like they're cannibalizing each other strongly such that if I start distributing on iTunes, I'm worried that's going to directly cannibalize my DVD sales. If I start uh, providing my content on Hulu, I'm worried that's going to directly cannibalize my TV viewership. Our research seems to suggest, and I can talk a little bit more about this in the Q&A time, that that view of the consumer is actually reversed. That consumers choose the channel they want to consume in first, and then they choose among the products that are available in that channel. Think digital versus analog. If I'm a digital consumer and I can't find product A in my digital channel, how likely am I to get that through, through piracy versus to go back to CD or DVD sales? Uh, our, our research suggests uh, uh, that not distributing digitally the way the consumer wants it is likely to increase the demand for piracy. Okay? And with that, I'll stop. Larry? Uh, thanks, Tim. Um, so, you know, the, the title of this conference is State of the Net. It would be wrong to say anything without first acknowledging that today the State of the Net is very, very annoyed. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's certainly an interesting lesson, something, as uh, Congressman Powell said, it's unprecedented, the, the nature of this particular response. And I think one that does indicate uh, at, at last a sort of a sea change, which is certainly relevant to this, uh, to this topic. Um, so the next book I'm working on is, is looking at the sort of structural way in which industries transform in the face of disruptive technologies. And a couple of common elements that are certainly visible in this transformation to the cloud and to digital distribution for media, uh, similar to any previous kind of uh, industry transformation. Uh, it's entirely predictable that, that the, tr the sort of traditional industry participants will resist uh, change and that they will use the courts and legislatures, in this case Congress, to try and slow the pace of change. Uh, ultimately, of course, the, the technology wins, but in the interim period, uh, you can kind of skew uh, or change the, the nature of the emerging model uh, through this kind of regulatory or uh, uh, litigation uh, arbitrage. Uh, so it's still worth talking about, even though you know, sort of, we, we sort of guess the outcome, but the interim period is still relevant and we still can apply policy levers to try and get the best possible economic uh, outcome. Uh, as we heard yesterday, uh, I think, on the SOPA panel, it's, it's clear that if sort of a, you look at the kind of Kubler-Ross stages of, uh, of despair, uh, that the media industry is past the denial stage now after several years of, of sort of you know, digital media. They're clearly now firmly in the anger stage. Uh, there's a couple more to go before they actually get to acceptance. 
So we'll continue to see these kinds of uh, regulatory arbitrage efforts, whether they succeed or not. I think the main problem we've got, and it certainly is very relevant to the policy problem, the main problem we have is it's actually the choice of metaphor. Um, we have talked now for 200 years about uh, what we talk, refer to as in, in intellectual property. So the, the metaphor, which is deeply encoded in law, is that information is a kind of property. Uh, even just the very names, you know, we talk about the media industry, the recording industry, the newspaper industry, just the way the industry describes itself focuses on the physical artifact, which made sense when the bulk of the costs in creation and distribution were in the physical artifact itself. Well, now that we've divorced the artifact from the content, the metaphor doesn't work anymore. Uh, and in fact, it's getting in the way. It gets in the way for transformation of the industry, but also gets in the way for consumers. I did a, an article maybe a, a year ago talking about sort of the, the, the benefits of renting versus owning information and the kind of, you know, I've just sort of never gotten that much savage response in the comments back saying, you know, I own this, it's mine, I can do what I want with it, I can dispense, dispose of it the way I want. We have trained consumers for 200 years to think about information as a kind of property. We have trained the industry to think that way as well. And breaking the metaphor uh, will be the hardest part about this, particularly because, as I say, the metaphor is so deeply, deeply entrenched into uh, our legal system in both obvious ways, intellectual property, so-called intellectual property laws, and in subtle ways uh, as well. Uh, I want to suggest that there are sort of three regulatory issues that we can talk about. Uh, in, I'll just name them now. We can talk about them in detail, uh, hopefully, as we, we go forward, that would be essential, I think, to smoothing this transition and getting the best economic value in the quickest amount of time. One would be a sort of wholesale reform of the entire copyright system, uh, not, re not getting rid of it, not replacing it, but certainly uh, taking out the property metaphor to the extent possible, replacing it with a, a use and licensing model, I think is much more effective. Uh, and by the way, that gets into privacy as well, but, but we'll not talk about that here. The second thing, and we heard about this a little bit yesterday in the, the Pandora discussion, is a sort of rationalization of the statutory licensing schemes. There are multiple, sort of each content platform has its own regulatory scheme and licensing scheme. Uh, again, it made sense when the different medias, as, as, as Michael said, the different medias uh, were cannibalistic to each other, but as consumers now choose based on the, on the channel, uh, rationalizing, the, there's a lot of sort of skewing that happens just because of how the, the licensing regimes work or don't work and transaction costs and the and license. Uh, rationalizing that would, would be essential. And I think the third one, which is worth mentioning, particularly relevant to, to Craig Moffat's comments, is the way in which traditional content delivery platforms are now at a regulatory disadvantage, uh, which again may no longer make sense and may need to be rationalized. So if you're a traditional broadcaster or your traditional uh, uh, content deliverer, multi-channel, multi-programming uh, channel, you live essentially under the, under st still a number, very big and some very small FCC rules in particular about you know, retransmission and must carry and franchising fees and certain taxes um, that an over-the-top distributor in the cloud doesn't live with. Uh, and it's, it would be essential, again, to getting the right result to looking at, well, why do we still have those? Do we still need those? Uh, are they skewing the, the way in which uh, consumers make their choices in an in a uneconomical or inefficient way? Okay. Daniel? Thanks, Larry. Um, well, I'm honored to be in such a distinguished company. And as a matter of fact, as a student, I've read one of your books, so I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Uh, as you can tell by my accent, I'm not from around here. Uh, I grew up in Germany. I live in Germany, and Germany is where I practice legal, uh, the legal profession. Um, counsel to uh, the secure data logistics provider Rapid Share, which uh, happens to have been founded by a German citizen as well, but they're now headquartered in Switzerland. Um, Rapid Share is proud to uh, count among its employees people from all over the world, from Europe, Asia, America. Um, we even have customers from Antarctica and obviously a lot of people from North America. Um, <coughs> A lot of the companies we do business with are from all over the world, a lot of them from the United States as well. And all of this reinforces my point. Um, the market appetite, appetite for secure data logistics companies transcends national boundaries, and so does the cloud. 
uh, we would have never imagined uh, the cloud being so big uh, just, a, just a few years ago. Um, but right now we all know that whatever type of regulations we come up with in one country affects uh, the cloud uh, all over the world, uh, which is why I think that we got to re be really careful what we do here in the United States. Uh, we're all in this together. Uh, the stakes, as the conference speakers have all pointed out, are enormous. And it's not just the policymakers in Washington, D.C. trying to figure out what to do with the cloud. Uh, gatherings similar to this one take place virtually everywhere in Brussels, uh, in, in, in other countries and uh, different political and business uh, arenas around the world. I believe that we just have one shot uh, to shape the cloud and fulfill its promise. We're uh, not going to get a do-over. Um, the global economy can't afford uh, missteps. And um, so many cutting edge, techno cutting edge technologies and so many jobs acro uh, across the globe depend on a healthy and robust cloud. Uh, I am an attorney and not a technician and I don't have the technical expertise of other speakers at this conference, uh, but I can offer my perspective as an attorney. As an attorney who has advised tech entrepreneurs uh, on how to follow the law on copyright. Um, I've been dedicated to help RapidShare improve its services, to expand, to expand its global market share, and to adhere to its vote to crack down on copyright abuse, uh, which is why I believe that I really know what I talk about when uh, talking about privacy. And uh, my main concern is be careful with what, whatever regulations you come up with. Things like SOPA or PIPA can really choke uh, a new and growing business model, and that's not just for RapidShare, but for another a lot of other companies as well. Um, yeah, we, we can get into the details a little later, uh, a little later but that's uh, my core message. Uh, do nothing in haste, uh, solicit input from multiple parties before acting, and uh, remember that the key to the success of the net was freedom. Um, yeah, that's a good thought. Uh, government regulators let the net take the route, and uh, that's a good thought for policymakers to keep in mind as they contemplate the cloud. Uh, Lee? Um, yeah, um, first of all, uh, in full disclosure, I'm here uh, sort of to help represent the, uh, the idea of the, the, the thinking of copyright owners, uh, partly because in my, uh, in my role helping represent digital media companies, I do an awful lot of interfacing with, with copyright owners and also the beginning of my career um, was spent representing copyright owners. Um, at, at the risk of getting a little bit too nuts and bolts, and Tim, you can uh, spank me for getting too into the weeds for this if I do, um, to pick up on something that Michael had said, and I, and I think Larry uh, also kind of touched on it when he talked about the fact that you know, in these, in, as we go through the phase of changing uh, a particular industry from, as we have here, from say a physical industry to a digital industry, um, the existing business models and the existing owners of those business models will always kind of fight to try to maintain their control over the old business model and try to stem the the you know, inevitable tide of the, of the change that occurs to them. And that kind of touched on what Michael said about uh, at least one of his kind of uh, paradigms that he wanted us to think about is the idea of, well, are we really talking about the size of a pie and how to slice the pie? And I think the, the point that I, I'm, I'd like to make is that when we talk about the current existing copyright regime and IP regime and the laws that exist, especially as they relate to cloud computing, file storage, and access, what you have there is a, is a system that's built on the way people used to divide that pie in a very, very physical world. Um, we have a copyright law like, for instance, uh, in the area that I deal with mostly, which is, which is the access of media, copyrighted material, most, most of which is music at this point due to bandwidth constraints and, and the way the marketplace is moving, um, you have a copyright paradigm that kind of respects an old physical world that says there are kind of siloed interests, right? You have people who are interested in the reproduction and distribution of physical copies. 
and then on the other side you have uh, people who are interested in collecting royalties and controlling the rights that are associated with the performances of musical compositions to end users. Um, and the issues there that uh, get brought into the I get brought into the business of cloud computing because those two silos, while it was easy to keep them separate in a physical world, um, it's very difficult to keep them separate in a cloud world. Um, when I can access all of my music, all of my media from a cloud on any number of devices, um, and I might be able to access them from somebody else who has them on a rapid share account, the issue of whether or not I bought a copy and paid a particular <coughs> price for that and paid a, a specific set of royalties for that versus whether I am receiving a performance for which there's a whole nother set of particular copyright interests and particular royalties that would be paid gets very, very blurred. Um, and so I think the issue uh, with regard to cloud computing is exactly, it, it's how copyright owners view their pre-existing rights in the current regime that we have now being exploited within this new context where people can store media, access it, possibly access either a subscription or a cloud or their own, or their own data um, within that cloud. And that's, that's really the, the, the rub point there is whether or not our current copyright regime is flexible enough to, to, to encompass all of that and to take it into account. Well, well I, I want to go really quickly to questions. Um, I think a lot of people have questions, and, and we can do that. But before we do, and I also we need to move this along to get to the next panel. Um, that said, you know what we did ha want to have ultraviolet here. We we, we actually they demonstrated at one of the tech exhibitions for the Congressional Internet Caucus um, in the Senate Building not too long ago. Uh, we wanted to have them talk about in the context of the cloud how this works. Um, and since then, um, their, their exhibition, they've actually rolled out their service. I actually got a DVD, Kung Fu Panda 2, um, that had an ultraviolet uh, version on it as well as Blu-ray and, and standard DVD. How, how do you think um, that's, is that a step in the right direction for that industry, um, ultraviolet, and you're giving people what they want where they want it? Is that, is that Lee? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd have to say that I think the advent of ultraviolet really kind of shows the, the Hollywood studios, it shows the, the, the movie industry and the, and the television industry and all the partners in the ultraviolet campaign um, really having seen what happened to the music business that went before them. Um, and, and I have to applaud it as, a, as an overall um, uh, approach because I think what they've realized and what ultraviolet, at least from my perspective, seems to show is that you've got a group of content owners that are sitting there and saying, well, maybe the best way to help combat the, the slow erosion of our market share is not necessarily just to get a bigger hammer um, and hit people with a bigger hammer. Maybe the thing to do is to try to, as best we can, satisfy consumer interest, right? And consumer interest is to have access to as much media on as many devices as possible as the consumer wants. And I think ultraviolet is a, is a very, very positive step in that direction, right? It's showing content owners saying, we're going to try to give you multiple levels of access on multiple devices simultaneously for a single purchase price. Uh, Larry, Michael, would you agree with that? Uh, sort of. I mean, I think the, the, the idea is right. The problem is it's sort of like a, a shiny new building built on a rotten foundation. The, the idea is, you know, it's still, it, it's a hybrid. You're, you're still buying a physical copy and physical copy and everything that goes with it is still at the core of how these, you know, ultraviolet sort of similar one by multi-use uh, licenses work, um, but it still suggests the copy is the, is the thing you're buying and you're, you're sort of getting these other things maybe for an extra price or maybe for, for no extra price. But yes, the general idea of selling access as opposed to copies uh, is the right one. It's just, I think it's an early stage. It's, there, there's a lot of more steps that have to happen to get it right. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty close to, to Larry on this one. I, I think some of the things I tell my students is, it's interesting to look at pirate services as a way of thinking about what consumers really want, right? There's a sense in which they want it free, and obviously that in, 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 in extension can't, isn't sustainable, but there's also a sense in which they want it here, now, convenient, easily searchable, blah, 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 and I think the more, the closer you get to providing that, uh, the better we'll all be off. 
Uh, but shouldn't shouldn't we um, divorce kind of the public policy question about you know copyright, copyright enforcement, licensing from a regulatory perspective, from you know the actual business models in Washington? Shouldn't we kind of divorce those things because time and time again, for years, going back to Napster, um, and even before that, um, people say, well, we don't like your business model um, to to the entertainment companies. You know that their business model is their business model. I mean, who who are we to kind of from a public policy perspective to kind of indict their business model? And um, you know. Uh, Frankly, uh, uh, isn't it that the entertainment industries, if they're losing revenue um, from piracy, shouldn't that be the trade association, uh, whatever trade association they have, their, their main focus to go after? Um, and, and shouldn't these things too be, you know, Larry, as a free market person, I would think you'd be like, well, you, the business decisions you make are the business decisions you make, and the public policy decisions are, are, are separate. So the problem here is that, in some sense, the, the current version of what the industry is is entirely a creation of the regulatory environment. Um, you know, we have the copyright system, which was set up to try and balance the desire, of, you know, get get content to the public at the best possible uh, level uh, and the best possible price, balanced with the incentives to creators. And as that model started to erode from a revenue standpoint, as you say, the industry, and again, I, this is this is a natural response, but they went back time and time again to Congress and said, let's keep you know, upping the, the penalties, let's keep uh, adding time to the, the, essentially, rather than innovate in a business sense, they innovated legally. So in some ways, they're, they're their own worst enemy, they're, they're sort of their own victim here. They've now created an industry which is nothing but a regulatory creation. It's really a totally artificial structure, and, and therefore the only way it's gonna get reformed is, is to go back to the to policy questions. Daniel? Yeah, I, I totally agree with, with Larry, um, and the thing is, I believe that um, this, if people want to make us believe that there is black and white, piracy is black, everything licensed is white, that's just not true because obviously the question whatever, what, what piracy is depends on from what angle and from what part of the world you look at the problem because uh, regulations and, and the legal statutes are different all over the world in Europe where I'm from. Um, personal copies are perfectly legitimate. I may upload a copy that I've bought and, and uh, store a digital copy on RapidShare and, and listen to that song wherever I am and whatever mobile device I want. In other countries, and as far as my understanding setting it is, and also in the United States, this is more problematic, but in Europe it, it's perfectly legal. So um, it's not really a black and white air uh, thing, it's, it's really matter of uh, regulation and, and uh, what the government uh, and, and what copyright says. And um, I guess that we, th this really supports my point that, that we can't over-regulate uh, this new upcoming, upcoming technology and, and really got to be a little more liberal and, and see what uh, other people in other parts of the world may say. We, we can't, if something, if, if the U.S. government would, people pre uh, would prevent people from uploading songs to rapid share, they would prevent something, uh, Europeans to do something that's perfectly legal in Europe. I'll take a little bit more black and white view of, of piracy, right? If, if somebody creates something and you uh, take it without their permission, that sounds to me like uh, stealing. And this comes from a professor who I'd be very grumpy if uh, students started going to my classes on YouTube and stopped paying tuition. That, that would make me very sad. Um, <laughs> at the same time, I wonder if the, the media industries and the consumers could all be better off if we would focus on changing the business models. Clay Christensen's written uh, books on disruptive change and the idea that every single industry that goes through this sorts of disruption, there are interests in that industry to cling to the old business model to the detriment of the industry. Uh, and you see this in Encyclopedia Britannica, you see this in a bunch of different places. By the way, in 10 years, we'll be talking about this in the context of academia. Uh, I'm wondering whether the media industries would do well thinking about Clay Christensen's advice, which one piece of it is create a skunk work, something independent from the main organization that can think about how to deliver value in the new world, uh, and maybe even focus on some of these uh, new technologies as uh, skunk works, if you will. Yeah, um, I, I, I wanted to kind of pick up on that. I, I agree with what everybody's saying, and to kind of bring it back around to the, you know, at least the stated uh, uh, topic of the, of the discussion, I mean, we're really not supposed to be talking about piracy, right? We're supposed to be talking about the cloud and, and, and how this rolls out. And to pick up on, on Larry's point, 
uh, you know, I'm, I'm currently involved with a lot of companies that, are, that have rolled out various uh, cloud-based media service models. I'm currently involved in negotiations on some others that haven't been rolled out yet. And all of those negotiations are being uh, shaped by the existing legal framework, right? Every company that has a cloud-based service, whether it's currently rolled out, being rolled out, or on the drawing board, is thinking about, well, how does that service fit into the existing legal framework? Not necessarily, what's the best thing we could provide to our consumers that might grow the market share the largest for copyright owners, that might be ultimately the most financially beneficial thing to do. Um, and so the unfortunate truth is, while Tim, I, I appreciate your, your inquiry that, you know, shouldn't we divorce the policy and the politics from the business models, the, the, the reality is you can't because the, of the existing paradigm that you have now. And I'm watching high-tech companies literally shelve ideas because they're unworkable within a legal framework. Current, completely workable within a technological framework, completely workable within a cloud computing uh, uh, sphere that we have available to us now in terms of bandwidth and stuff like that. But they have to shelve them because the existing legal framework won't allow that type of business model to, to exist. But, but isn't it a fair point <clears throat> that the, the, the entertainment companies, um, they, they, they're light, it's not easy for them to license in, uh, in the free market. I mean, they have a lot with their membership, they, with regard to music, with books, uh, with movies, television. There's all sorts of rights that they have to get through, and it's very, very difficult to say, okay, you can have that license. Um, uh, we were very sympathetic um, this summer when we had this kind of workshop uh, looking at the difference between uh, iTunes iCloud, which has, has, a, has a license, um, and Amazon's cloud, and, and Google's cloud, and, and we had a chart that was like you know, 15 of them. Uh, some were kind of hybrid streaming, but, but still, the reality is it's really hard, it, it is really hard for them to license, and it gets even harder, I think, in the motion picture space um, and, and television shows. So um, isn't there a fair point that just, just the way this content is created with all sorts of, part it's almost like I, maybe a, a poor analogy with patents, you know, like a, an electronic device has a lot of different pat patents associated with it, and that whole process to kind of free that up um, is really quite difficult. I guess the same for entertainment. Isn't, isn't it fair to say that the, the licensing structures uh, for, for artists is just really difficult? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, I think the answer is yes. Yeah, it's, it, you got to give them, you got to... No, no, they, they're an incredibly hard situation, right? You've got to get a lot of people to all agree at the same time, and you have to worry about upstream interests <laughs> from the artists and the creators and downstream interests from your existing uh, uh, distribution platforms. It's an incredibly hard problem. Yeah, from, from an economic standpoint, it's, and it's not the only industry, but it has the, the cap it has the structure of very, very high initial production costs and very, very low yep. marginal costs for, you know, actual distribution. And that, of course, you know, that's why we have copyright, in order to smooth out that kind of uh, economic <laughs> weirdness. There's a couple things to, to understand. Well, I, mean, I think the biggest problem from licensing for, for the digital media, for the cloud, is it's very difficult to know what the right price is because you don't know what the marginal costs are that are you know consumers are willing to pay and therefore you don't know how many you're going to get and therefore you don't know how to set the price uh, ex ante. Uh, you may remember that the writer strike, the, the the holdout issue for for months and the writer strike was what would be the residuals on digital media and they couldn't answer neither side could answer the question because we don't actually know. Uh, in part, the solution is experimentation. In part, the solution is compulsory license, statutory licenses. That's been used in the past when we've had new media uh, to, to try and answer this question, which we can't otherwise uh, uh, answer in the abstract. So just to punctuate your point, it, it's really, you know, when the, we had a debate yesterday on SOPA, just specifically on SOPA, which we didn't want this to be about SOPA. Um, and and, and the, the, the anti-SOPA uh, panelists uh, ended by saying, well, you know, they need to roll out these legitimate business models. They need to roll out the business models and, and not do this. Um, and, I, and I, you know, I, I was kind of struck that, it, it, as you're saying, it's, it's really kind of complicated and it's really hard. And, and so I'm just punctuating the fact that it's a really difficult process and it's not as easy as one might think. Although I, I will say you know, I, that the, the economics of the media industry also create some unique opportunities. Uh, so for example, we worked with a publisher who gave away a set of their really low-selling Kindle titles for a period of about a month on Amazon. 
and you went from books that were selling one or two copies a week to getting 12,000 free downloads, and when they came back to a paid version, they were getting something like 400 and 500 purchases. Um, that's not possible in a physical world just because of the marginal cost, but it is doable in, in a digital world. By the same token, one of the things you can do with digital goods is bundle them together. And in fact, the economic theory says that's the most efficient way to price things for the producer. The producer can extract the most surplus through a bundle uh, than they can through selling individual goods. That gets us back to the point of, you know, then, then it becomes challenging to get everybody to, to agree what goes in that bundle. And, I, and I, I'd like to go to I'd like to go to questions, uh, if I may, um, and then I don't think we're going to maybe for another ten minutes. But I think before we do, we probably talk about um, uh, the cloud service rap, rapid share and kind of what what uh, the question about authorized access and, and and if and if you did want, let's say, um, uh, music companies to license to Amazon's cloud and, and YouTube's cloud and everybody else's cloud, um, what assurances are there that you know the the the, the material would just be used for personal use for that that person, and, and, and how to kind of stem the bleed of, of perhaps piracy. So we should talk. We should talk about that. And uh, so, but let me go to questions. Anybody have any questions? So you touched on this a little bit, but one of the things that I'm very curious about is we have an entire generation coming up behind us that essentially doesn't care about ownership, right? They're comfortable not having a car, they can use Zipcar. They're comfortable not owning their music, they can use Spotify. So when you're talking about you know, subscription-based cloud services versus uh, a generation that in addition to comfortable not owning, is also comfortable giving up a lot of their own information in exchange for that. Right, so that they can have it for free at, our, at a discounted price. And I was wondering if you can talk a little bit about what that marketplace in the cloud-based world means, and also what that means for future policy, because we're talking about ownership and the cloud and cross-border you know, data flow, et cetera, but we're not talking about, well, that's going to rapidly evolve to a non-ownership society. So I was curious what you could say about that. Yeah, I, well, I'm not sure. I, I hope you're right in the sense that I, I hope that is the, the mindset of the next generation, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not entirely confident that they don't still have some of the sort of infection uh, of previous generations with this idea that content, copies, ownership, sort of physical, that they don't still have that, that metaphor embedded. Um, there are, as you say, some very uh, um, interesting and, and positive signs that, that they sort of get that there's a better economic model. And I think, you know, the most interesting thing about the way information works when you divorce it from the physical artifact is you have this idea of collaboration, that information, you know, it's, it's inexhaustible, it has marginal cost of zero, it has returning uh, economies of scale, uh, and that the more it's used and, you know, remixing or collaboration, whatever it is, it becomes more valuable, and that there's, in fact, not just a I created it, you used it kind of uh, interaction, but, in fact, we're, we're collaborating on it together, and that the result is now something new and potentially more valuable than what we each started with. Uh, and that it's sort of a barter economy that, that might develop. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't think it's just generational. I don't think it's sort of a switch will be flipped when us old fogies uh, 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 die off. Uh, I think it'll be more gradual than that, but I hope, I, I hope it's fast. Of course, back. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine, thank you. Uh, listening to you guys talk about the paradigms, I was struck that it seems that software has managed to kind of skirt this, and they've addressed it in many ways. You know, you can license copies of software. You, there's software as a service, which I think is sort of analogous to the yeah. streaming media. And I, I wonder if there's anything that you can take from that industry and apply to this industry. And if not, if it, is it just the legal blockades that are in the way, or are there other reasons? Well, I'm sorry, I don't want to. Dominic, but I mean, one thing you can say about software that I think is different is that it's always had a much higher tolerance for unlicensed use uh, than, than other forms of media, and you know, partly on the basis of saying, well, you know, we're going to let students use our software either at a much, much discounted price or just going to ignore unlicensed use on the, on the knowledge that they don't have the money to pay for it anyway, and that when they grow up and they go into, you know, corporate life, they'll have now been, you know, sort of caught in our web and that's what they'll buy when they actually do have the money. Uh, I don't know how conscious a model that was, some, some conscious and unconscious, but it does seem to have worked out better 
for software, not perfect, but better for software than for entertainment uh, media. I, I would just add to that that, uh, you know, I think it, we have to extend, again, one of the things that Larry said earlier about that. Uh, I, I think one of the issues of the distinction between software and other mm -hmm. types of entertainment media is that software has grown up largely um, after the advent of what I was talking about before about this, you know, these decades old, indeed centuries old, kind of paradigms of, of these various siloed structures where you, and, and we talked about, you know, the difficulties in licensing where there's multiple, multiple parties and, and over again centuries of assertion of legal rights and the establishment of a legislative regime that respects all of these different types of legal rights. Um, it becomes very, very difficult to license. It becomes, uh, the industry becomes entrenched in that business model and protecting the revenue streams that come through that business model. Um, and you really don't have that in, in the software industry. While software is certainly IP and there is, a, there is a, a revenue stream there that needs to be protected and software companies are, are fairly zealous about protecting their revenue stream as it relates to their intellectual property. They don't have 150 years of, uh, well, s software used to get played on the radio. Um, and then, you know, we had vinyl discs, and we had eight tracks, and then we had, you know, CDs, and, and, and there's a difference between the person that wrote the code and the person that actually typed the code into the machine. All these kinds of, uh, you know, archaic distinctions that, that, are, that still hang around the music business, um, the book publishing business to a certain extent, the movie business to a large extent, don't really exist in the software world. They really have just a single IP right that they're trying to protect, and so it's a little bit more streamlined. That, that was the difference I was going to mention. The only other difference uh, that I think is important is software companies have historically seen strong network effects uh, from adoption. So if, if Larry, Lee, and, and Daniel all use Microsoft Office, even if it's kind of pirated, that still raises my value of using Microsoft Office. And it's, it's the media, media industries haven't had the data to analyze that question. I think I have time for one more question in the back. Yeah, um, this is the question for, for the gentleman from Rapid Share. Um, you know, one of the ways I think to stop you know, burdensome government regulation is to have self regulation, have industry kind of take the lead on issues. Um, you know, you said UGC sites did this, like YouTube, that use content identification to make sure there's no pirated content up there. But when I do a search for, you know, download movies in Rapid Share, I get a lot of links back, and you know, you see a lot of sites. Hypothetically speaking, right? No, I, I just did it. <laughs> so my question to you is, you know, what responsibilities do you think Rapid Share has um, to be a responsible player in the internet ecosystem? What more can you be doing? Well, first of all, I'm surprised that you really found a lot of links uh, because we were pretty proactive in taking them down. We, I know that. Um, couple link aggregator sites uh, misuse our trademark, which is why RapidShare keeps popping up whenever you do a Google search. But if you actually follow the link, you're gonna be surprised that most of the links that you find under the name of RapidShare actually lead you to mega upload, Filesonic, and, and other companies, because we're being just much more proactive than they are. Um, but um, back to your question, what we believe that, uh, what our uh, obligation to society is, I think that's basically what you were asking me. Um, I believe that um, the technology that we're operating is pretty powerful. It's um, a technology that has uh, the power to change the way we consume entertainment, and this gives us a responsibility, to, responsibility both to our users, privacy, things like that, but also to copyright owners and to society itself. Um, we have therefore been uh, spearheading uh, the industry's efforts to uh, come up with best practices. Uh, you will see something that we'll publish something uh, probably in the, the end of the first quarter, 2012, maybe second quarter. Um, but I can already tell you a little bit about what we do. And uh, first of all, we believe that um, cloud computing services, secure data logistics companies uh, need to have extremely fast uh, uh, times on takedowns uh, on rapid share it's right now uh, about one hour during regular business hours and uh, less than a day on the weekend uh, we even have weekend shifts um, 
which is well, a funny story. The, the entertainment industry and the movie studios told us about how important the premiere weekend is in, uh, for the success of American movies. And uh, Record Share learned about that. There is an ongoing di dialogue with them. And uh, therefore, we decided that we had to have people on the weekend. You guys, as Americans. Is it illegal in Germany to have weekenders? <laughs> yeah, that brings me to a little point. So, um, <laughs> you, guys, you guys in the United States probably think that this is not a big deal, having people in on the weekend. But in Switzerland, as a matter of fact, this is illegal. We had to get a government permission to have people coming in on the weekends was quite a bureaucratic hassle, so right now we are fortunate enough and, and happy to tell everyone that we have people on the weekend. It's a pretty big, small step to Americans, but a big step for us. Um, and uh, anyway, so this is just uh, the, the first of a lot of things that we believe we're obligated to do. The next uh, thing is that we were the first ones to implement a three-strike policy meaning that uh, repeat offenders uh, get their accounts terminated and all the, the files that they've uploaded deleted. Uh, this has actually turned out to be really effective because um, pirates um, put, it up, put a lot of work, at least they would consider it to be work, uh, into filling their rapid share accounts. Um, their bandwidth is usually stuck for several days if they want to upload one movie after another and if rapid share goes out and terminates their account, they're usually pretty upset about it and go to a competitor. Uh, we're not really sad about that, um, but at least it really helped solve the problem. And um, <coughs> finally, we uh, came up with a crawling technology that's constantly monitoring uh, notorious link aggregator websites and uh, internet forums that are notorious for uh, uploading infringing content, which is why we constantly build and uh, collect information in a database uh, that allows us to take illegal stuff down with a single click of a button. Well, uh, with, let me just um, punctuate the point again. Um, I, I really hope that your best practices do come online and they are really substantial because um, you, when it comes to you know, theft of uh, pirated works, I mean, today, they're, they're, I went to research uh, an item for this particular panel or, or the next panel, and I couldn't find it because Wiki, Wikipedia went dark. Um, there's a tremendous amount of effort going into legislation here in the United States. There's a lot of fighting amongst industries about legislation. Members of Congress are spending a lot of time on this issue. And uh, there's a huge outlay of resources and, and issues here at play because there are pirating sites, there, there are sites where users are allowing um, copyrighted works to be infringed um, outside of the jurisdiction of the United States. So I, I really hope that, you know, RapidShare can, can really kind of cut off piracy and actually be a model for as best practices for other sites because it has created an enormous amount of effort here in the United States. So. Um, uh, with that, I, I want to thank everybody on the panel for speaking. Um, I, I have to, I'm going to turn it over um, quickly. Let me just introduce um, our next moderator for the next panel. Um, we have, uh, the, the next panel is called Collision Course, Entertainment Media and Bandwidth Constraints. Um, it really keys off of um, Mr. Moffitt's uh, 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 presentation, the PowerPoint of which um, is it, we put on Twitter and it's on our website, so uh, you can you can follow along if you want to pull up that PowerPoint. Uh, Larry Irving is the moderator of the next panel, and I'll let, I'll let him introduce the rest of the panelists. Um, Larry, I've been working, uh, hoping to work for Larry since I came down to Washington um, in 1994, um, but every time uh, I, I never quite make it. I, I, he, was, <laughs> he had just left Congressman Markey's office before I, I, I went to work for the subcommittee on telecommunications one summer, um, but um, I, I, I had the fortune of interning when he was chief of NTIA. Um, he was just recently was the head of global government affairs for Hewlett Packard. Um, he's the smartest person I know on these issues. And uh, let me introduce uh, Larry and thank the panelists.